Sa pinili kong adalan Gabay nga hindi pa Ulihi ang talan Di na Mga sinya sa cross Nga alagyan Ang talag ko Nga talang-talang Nagtalang-talang Nga talang-talang Dapa-dapa Naga pa tayo sa panglakaton Uy iining mga buhat Nga dalalon sa imo Paminsaron Kagbalat tiyagon Uy iining mga buhat Nga dalalon Nga dalalon Nga dalalon Dali na kay maimo Ta Sang bago Nga kali O labing makagagahom nga amay namon sa langit. Mahinuklugon nga laon nga tagtugas ang langit, hangin, kalayo, tubig, kagduta. Tanda ining imong timawa, kabay ining pag-ampo, magadulot sa amon sa kabuhi nga himaya. Salamat sa mga bugay na imugin paambit sa amon. Salamat sa kabuhi na ginadulot mo sa amon na himpit. Salamat sa maayong na panahon kag ilabinagid sang imo katutong sa amon. Bindisyon ni ang imo katawhan. Bindisyon ni ang ila mga palangabuhian. Bindisyon ni ang mga panggas sa amon mga talamnan. Bindisyon ni ang ilang paglugayawan sa iban nga kapungsuran. Gabay, makalabot sila ng walay sablag sa ila pagapadulungan. Kag ila binagid, bindisyon ni ining isla sang negros na amon na tawahan.
Inahalad namon ang ining pag-ampo para sa imo kadayawan. Maayong aga, good morning to everyone, and welcome to Viva XCon 2020. My name is Gina olivares Hoxon, and I am a consultant for Viva XCon 2020. And this morning, I will be your moderator for this session of VCon 2. I would like to mention that this webinar is being live streamed on Viva XCon 2020's YouTube channel and Facebook account. A recording of the webinar will be available for viewing within the day in these platforms. So without further ado, I would now like to call on our ExCon director, Mr. Manny Montelibano, to say a few words. Manny, please. Hi, good morning, everyone. Mayong buntag. Magandang umaga to our fellow artists, cultural workers, and our audience. Um, I would like to thank the... Um, uh, our island coordinators and um, regional curators for attending today's session. And um, just to um, welcome everyone and have an idea, um, to, to give an idea of um, the VCON component of Viva XCON. Well, um, Viva XCON is a Visayas-wide biennial which started in 1990 in Bacolod City and whose hosting has since toured the Visayan Islands every two years without fail. It has become an effective artist-centered blueprint with which others like, other like initiatives have been part patterned after. It was the main goal of Viva XCON to celebrate Visayan art by bridging the islands of the Visayas so as to provide a venue to facilitate dialogues, interaction, networking, and cultural exchanges, thus addressing fundamental and relevant issues among visual art communities and related stakeholders. Having accomplished such goals in the 30 years of its existence, it now looks towards the future in ways that can best contribute to the development of the communities it serves. Given the reality of the 2020 pandemic, the limitation imposed by necessary precautionary measures and the impact of such to the mindset of artists, Viva XCON and the organization has recalibrated the festival design to in engage creative spirits in a virtual dynamics that is interactive online and will bring together the creative community so as to rise to the challenge of the times. The theme the soon or what now is in keeping with future studies, which, which postulates possible, probable, and preferable futures and the worldviews and myths that underlie them. What now? Seeks to understand the context and circumstance of the art community in relation to the sectors of the com community it coexists with. What is likely to continue and what could plausibly change? Part of the creative initiative is to seek a systematic and pattern-based understanding of the past and present, promote inclusivity, and determine, determine the likelihood of future events and trends so as to better respond with alternatives towards a much preferred future. The series of talks that we have for the VCON2 is directed towards this. I welcome everyone to our speakers. Thank you very much for giving us your time and sharing your experiences and ideas. Um, we welcome you and I hope you, um, our audience can get um, insights from today's session. Thank you very much and good morning. Thank you, Manny. Uh, this morning's webinar is divided into two talks that tackle two important elements in our art ecology, the art exhibition and the art market. After each talk, 
we will be having a question and answer segment. We encourage everyone to send their questions through the Zoom, Zoom chat box or the comment section of our Facebook account, which is called um, VivaXCon 2020. Now we will begin with the art market talk, which is entitled Art Market Prospects for Visayan Artists. We are privileged to have with us today three notable players in the Philippine art market. Our first speaker is Ms. Triki Lopa. Triki Lopa is chairperson of Philippine Art Events, Inc., the corporation that runs the game-changing Art Fair Philippines and Art in the Park, as well as the newer platforms, the Nonsuch Fair, and most recently, O2O Art. I believe that's offline to online art. She also acts as an advisor for PHX Fashion Conference, a mentorship initiative that aims to take local fashion brands to a global level. Tricky previously served on the Board of Trustees of the Museum Foundation of the Philippines as its board secretary and helped run several projects to support the National Museum and its network. She currently sits on the advisory board of the museum at De La Salle University, a post she has held since 2011. A former hotelier, fashion retailer, and arts blogger, Tricky holds a management economics degree from the Ateneo de Manila University. She has also taken courses in the history of decorative arts at the Victoria and Albert Museum in London. Let us all welcome Tricky Lopa. Good morning, Tricky. Hi, good morning. Um, thank you for having me. Uh, I'm a little nervous, but <laughs> um, it's nice to see everybody actually. We're happy to see you. Yeah. Please go on. Yeah, okay. So um, to start, um, the art market prospects for Visayan artists. Uh, my first slide, please, Ida. As many of you may know, we founded Art in the Park in 2006, mainly as an event to celebrate the second anniversary of the Salcedo Community Market. We decided at the same time, because I was newly elected to the board of the Museum Foundation of the Philippines, that we might as well make it a fundraising for the Museum Foundation of the Philippines, which at that time badly needed funds for its operations and its projects, and especially its mission to support the National Museum and its network. Next slide, Ida. Okay, I'm just going to show you a few uh, photos of where the Art in the Park funds have gone, have been spent on throughout the years. It is actually our 15th year and we're very sad not to be celebrating in the park live this year. Um, but in anyway, uh, this is the Museum Foundation of the Philippines foyer in the National Museum of Natural History. Next slide. Um, this is the Museum Foundation of the Philippines Hall at the National Museum of the Visual Arts. It houses the bottom Francisco murals that formerly were in the lobby of the Philippine General Hospital. Next slide. And I think um, last year, the Museum Foundation also um, provided funds to rehabilitate some portions of the planetarium. Next slide. Okay, I just wanted uh, to highlight Charlie's beautiful work, Men in Blue, that marked several personal art in the park milestones. This was in 2012, and it was the first time we counted 13,000 people in the park for Art in the Park. It was also when we realized we had outgrown half of the park and needed to occupy the entire uh, Jaime Velasquez Park, including the parking space that, um, uh, that was that's usually um, where the Salcedo Market is located. So we had to separate Art in the Park from the Salcedo Market. And of course, it was the first time that we had this beautiful large scale installation of an incredible artist from the Visayas. Okay, next. Um, next slide, yeah. This is just a photo of Orange Gallery at Art in the Park. We look forward to having them every year. There have also been so many Visayan artists um, who have sold works at Art in the Park. I actually cannot name them all, but just the top of my head, aside from Charlie, Mark Justiniani, who I actually first met um, at the second edition of Art in the Park, November 2006, when he had just arrived from the States and he had a few works 
on sale there. Um, I remember Raymond Legaspi. I remember always seeing Toto Tarosa walking around. And most recently, the younger ones, work of the younger ones from the Visayas, Faye Abantao and Gino. We actually get um, inquiries from other galleries from the Visayas to join Art in the Park every year. Um, it's just that, quite honestly, not everybody has something new to offer, which is why it seems like Orange Gallery has been the most consistent um, participant from the Visayas. This year, though, uh, we are happy to welcome Cube Gallery from Cebu. Next slide. Just a view of the park during the day. And next slide. The park at night. Okay, next slide, please. Okay, of course, our other event, as many of you may know, is Art Fair Philippines, which we established in 2013. Hold on, Lang Ida. Huh? Okay. I'd like to show you. No, it's okay. Go back. I'd like to show you a table of our statistics uh, just to share how the fair has grown in terms of visitors num visitor numbers since, we, um, since our first edition in 2013. We are proud to say that we've maintained our visitor numbers for the last three years to about 35,000 visitors. And this included this last event um, in 2020, three weeks before lockdown when we, of course, were there enjoying with the crowds. It's hard to imagine the crowds now, actually, um, how it was such a part of the art fair experience. Last Saturday, I tuned into a talk sponsored by C Focus, which is the art fair out of Singapore. And it was a talk um, by uh, curators of the different Asian Biennales. And one of them, I think she was the lady who is was part of the team curating the Guangzhou Biennale, which is supposed to go on this year. She described art as a social space and how um, taking away live events made her miss that aspect of art. And I guess nothing proves that art as a social space more than experiencing the crowds at Art Fair Philippines. Okay, please next slide, Ida. Okay, in the next few slides, You'll see photos from Visayan galleries and artists who we have welcomed to Art Fair Philippines. Our 2020 edition in particular did seem to end up with a Visayan focus given our choice of artists for the special projects and the new galleries we welcome to the fair. May I just point out that the artists and the galleries were selected and welcomed to the fair, not because they are Visayan, but because the galleries submitted great concepts and they have good programming and the artists do good work. Um, for the special projects, we work with a curator. In this case, it was Norman Crisologo. Really, we wanted to showcase artists who would bring in something fresh and different to the fair. And we think Neil Pasilan, Joe Geraldo, and Perry Arhel definitely did that. Next slide. These are a few of the galleries. Uh, for the first time, we welcome Tropical Futures from Cebu, and they featured an artist from Bacolod, Chris Ardena. We had um, Project Space Giatay, which is also from Cebu, and we also had Mariah Gallery from Dumaguete. They featured the work of uh, artist uh, Kitty Taniguchi. Next slide. There, just a, a few more. Um, that's Orange Gallery, I believe. Um, tropical Futures and again, Giatai. So that the artists, the artists are first and foremost great artists. The galleries have good concepts. That they happen to be from the Visayas is a happy occurrence. Next slide. One of the guide questions uh, that was sent to us was about the art market and how the pandemic will affect it. Unfortunately, it seems um, very difficult to uh, find any government figures on the size of the Philippine art market. I actually couldn't even find um, an accurate count of how many galleries actually exist in the country. Um, so I decided that I would make an educated estimate of what I thought the art market was in 2019. Um, and I think it's it would be safe to say it's almost 1 billion pesos in 2019. Um, I, as you know, I said educated estimate, which is nicer than saying an educated guess, but 
I did base this on something. It's based on what I've observed and been informed um, unofficially from galleries who participate in our art fair and other art fairs in the country. Um, sales of the auction houses, which are public, they, they put it on their websites, Art in the Park, and I assume that the rest of that would be made up by local galleries, private sales for local galleries. Somebody I had asked, I, I um, consulted even said this might be even on the conservative side, but I thought um, this would be my educated estimate. Next slide. However, as mentioned, since we don't have accurate figures from the government, I thought we should take a look at the effect of COVID-19 on the art market worldwide and try to extrapolate from that. In October of 2020, when most of the world had been through some form of lockdown or COVID-19 restrictions for about six months, I signed up for a conference sponsored by Deloitte Luxembourg, a consulting and financial advisory firm. And this ran for six days. They had um, various to topics, which was 10 p.m. in the evening because it was 10 a.m. in the East Coast of the U.S. at the time. And um, this provided a lot of interesting food for thought. Next slide. On the first day of the conference, Deloitte and Credit Suisse unveiled a joint report on the market for collectibles, which includes fine art. This report had already taken into consideration the effect of the pandemic on various collectibles, given that uh, this was October 2022. Next slide. As you can see from this slide, um, which by the way is a screenshot from the conference, so I, I we have to give Deloitte and Credit Suisse uh, credit for this, uh, for this image. The report indicates that auction sales had fallen 50% from 2020 worldwide compared to 2019. Let me highlight that this was in October. Um, now, to be honest, I'm not sure if our local auction sales mirror this figure. Um, I think this, it was true that things had fallen to about 50% of what it was in 2019 at the height of the lockdown or when the country was under ECQ uh, until about June. But I believe um, if you check the online um, sales figures that the auction houses post on their websites, things started picking up towards the last quarter of the year. And um, I also referred to a report by Sotheby's that their Asia Pacific sales did in fact also pick up towards the end of the year. Next slide. What is notable, however, is that not only have online sales increased by 3.5 times what it was in 2019, but that 40% of new customers were reached through virtual channels. I'm sure this is not the first time you're hearing how the pandemic has accelerated a, a digital shift. Um, perhaps luckily for the art market and the art scene, uh, we are one of the industries that could um, adapt to this very quickly. Pivot is the, seems to, be the, to have been the word of 2020 and the art scene seems to have done that quite well. So it would be safe to say that online exhibits and the purchasing of art through online channels, including social media and apps like Viber, WhatsApp, Telegram are here to stay, especially in this next year. Um, we ourselves are continuing with the online efforts, presenting the second edition of Art in the Park on February 21. Next slide, Ida. And the first online edition of Art Fair Philippines in April. Next slide. Okay, next slide. So what now? That's one. What next? Um, what's next as the new normal becomes the new future? In one of the guide questions you sent me, you asked me what my honest opinion was in terms of the prospects of Visayan artists in the current and future art markets. You also asked for tips and advice on how they should navigate into the main art market of Manila. I think the more appropriate question would be to ask, what should be done to create favorable conditions for the art scene to continue to thrive and expand here in the Visayas? Because obviously, given what I think the size of the art market is and the availability of tools that allow artists to reach beyond physical borders with online platforms, 
the prospects are limitless. How should we nurture the artists so that they can take advantage of these prospects? Next slide. In that same conference, um, there was an inter interesting section on how culture should be the center of cities of the future. Um, they were discussing the, the various roles that culture plays in economic development. This is another screenshot which I grabbed from the conference. And um, I high encircled the portion which describes culture as who we are and what shapes our identity. Culture contributes to poverty reduction and paves the way for human-centered, inclusive, and equitable development. No development can be sustainable without it. Next slide. The conference also touched on the creative industries. The creative industries has been increasingly recognized for its major role in pushing social and economic development. Figures show that the creative industries account for 3% of the world's GDP and provide 30 million jobs. What are the creative industries? Arts and crafts, architecture, advertising, design, fashion, film, video, photography, music, performing arts, publishing, research and development, software, computer games, electronic publishing, and TV and radio. If you look at the right side of this slide, all those blue and green circles, it says, it shows us what um, the findings are, uh, that the cultural, it's, it kind of tells us what the cultural sect, uh, sorry, the creative industries can contribute to our, to our daily lives, to our social development social cohesion and inclusion, psycho and physical well-being, growth of local tourism, indirect economic impact, social cultural, social cultural diversity, and urban regeneration. Next slide. In that same talk where they talked about the creative industries, um, they told us that in Asia, the creative industries accounts for about 743 billion US dollars of absolute GDP values and provides 12.7 million jobs. It was even posited that by 2030, the creative economy will even contribute to 10% of the world's GDP, resulting in 300 million jobs in the informal sector. So what am I saying here? What I'm saying is that in the big picture, it would seem that the best way to nurture the artists from the Visayas is to continue to nurture the cultural life of the Visayas. Next slide. Obviously, events like where we are now, Viva XCon, help do this for the contemporary art scene. But any investment in culture and support for the creative industries can only benefit the entire region. I'm sure I don't need to sell you on how much the Visayas has to offer, from your food to your beautiful sites to your valued to your varied traditions. By supporting the creative economy, you may not need to depend on just Manila as the market for your artists. So maybe what you should be asking is how to get more support for the creative economy of the Visayas. Next slide. Which brings me to um, the last part of my deck, of my talk today. What I think artists have to do on an individual level. Nurturing your culture translates to being authentic to who you are. I speak as someone wearing my collector's hat here. Um, and what attracts me to certain artists, authenticity and Authenticity and having the confidence on who you are always strikes a chord. This always comes through with one's work. I would like to provide you with examples of what I mean by authenticity, staying rooted to oneself, but doing work that resonates with a global audience. I will show you two artists from Africa, both relatively young, in their 30s, and both have pretty much captured the hearts of both critics and collectors. I think they are on top of the art food chain at the moment. Next slide. In this slide, I show you two paintings by the Kenyan British artist, Michael Armitage. These were paintings at the Venice Biennale in 2019. Armitage paints on, on cloth made from the lumbago bark, which is apparently a, tr uh, a treasured tree from his native Kenya. The paintings here depict um, scenes from election season in Kenya. Um, and I thought it would be nice to show work that was accessible, very relatable, um, easy for us to like to understand. And this comes, the, but still the beauty comes through. I mean, the the wonderful painting comes through. Next slide. 
Okay, this photo is one that I took when I stayed up until 3 a.m. to listen to Enshideka Akunuli Crosby, who is um, from Nigeria, speak about her work for a during a webinar sponsored by Brooklyn, Brooklyn Rail, the art magazine. Like Armitage, she's an artwork darling coveted by, art mar by the art market and museum curators. This is a work on paper, basically a collage of her drawings using colored pencils and acrylic transfers. Her work are very personal, usually depictions of her family life, openly celebrating her African heritage. Just please note, um, when I say staying true to who you are, it doesn't mean that you should live and practice in a vacuum. Um, deepen your roots because the Visayan soil is so rich, but your mind should expand out into the world. The plus side of this pandemic is the accessibility of resources such as talks and tours and social media posts of the biggest artists in the world. Next slide. Um, over the summer, our favorite lecture series that I made sure to tune into twice a week was uh, by the Whitney Museum. It was called Art History from Home, um, and it was a 30-minute talk by a curator on an artist in their collection. And live conversations also between curators and artists were always on Instagram Live almost every evening. I remember a particular, particularly memorable one that I enjoyed very much was between Hans Ulrich Obrist and Christian Woltanski, all via Instagram. Here is the highlight of my Christmas season when I was called to ask the great Ai Weiwei a question live. Um, again, it was a webinar and a talk sponsored by the Brooklyn Rail, and um, I was thrilled no end. If it wasn't for Zoom making the world smaller <laughs> and maybe the pandemic um, transforming our lives with online um, tools, I would never have been able to tune into a live talk of Ai Weiwei and ask him a question live unless I flew halfway across the world. Next slide. So I would like to end with a quote from the, collector, the collector's Dawn and Mira Rubel. This was, again, another talk. Uh, this was made during another talk that they did for C-Focus last Saturday about their collecting, um, their, their collecting. They were asked how they choose their artists for their collections. And I think their words would be applicable to any artist, whether or not they are from the Visayas. Every artist has a compelling story. Great artists have the ability to tell the story. So please share your stories. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Tricky, for providing us with a lot of data and insights that go a long way in demystifying the local art market. Our next speaker is Mr. Kublai Milan. Kublai is a prolific artist from Mindanao, famous for his giant sculptures located in Davao, as well as in various areas around the country. He is the president and founding member of Lawig Diwa Inc., the organizing nonprofit behind the Mindanao Art Fair. A photographer, painter, performance artist and sculptor, Kublai studied at the University of the Philippines in Diliman, Quezon City, before returning to Davao City in 1999. He dedicates his life's works to his community, shaping it with assorted artistic engagements to, pro to promote unity, peace and joy, the very values he envisions for his beloved land. Let us all please welcome Mr. Kublai Milan. Kublai, please. Uh, we have to unmute you. Do I press? Ah, there, there you are. We can hear you. Okay. Mayang aga. Mayang aga. Uh, good, oh, good morning, Satanan. Thank you for having me. Should I start, what? Ah, yes, please go ahead. Ah, yes, yes, okay. Um, here in, uh, this morning, I would like to share our stories here in Mindanao, um, we would like to um, see like the Visayas and Luzon as our uh, brothers and sisters. Of course, uh, the Manila as the, the older sibling. So maybe from our stories here, uh, our brothers and sisters from the Visayas can learn something from, from what we have been doing 
for the last um, several years and, and during the pandemic. Uh, if, if I may, I'd like to start my story. The title of my talk is Life Lessons in Art, The Market and the People. The dream of having a thriving art industry in Mindanao is where Mindanao art digs its roots on. This is what we at Lawig Diwa, the mother organization of Mindanao art, for members constantly remind ourselves of that our goal is bigger than just one person, that it is even bigger than all of us in the group combined. We look to create an avenue that gathers Mindanaoan artists who are true to their roots and who are proactive in the celebration of their culture in the form of visual art. More so, we aim to create a lucrative opportunity for everyone so that the message of Mindanao cultural diversity and of Mindanaoan peace will ring louder in all parts of the country and the globe. Make your presence felt. Let me briefly introduce our organization. Lawig Diwa is a SEC registered nonprofit. With my friends, Lawig Diwa was organized in 2007 under different informal names, including Earthnake, Artists Helping Artists, etc. We started to source funding in 2018 when Lawig Diwa submitted a proposal to, to be the grantee for the NCCA, National Committee on Art Galleries Regional Art Fair. We are the recipient of that grant for the 2019-2020, just recently announced the 2021 Mindanao Art Fair. It was just a dream of evolving something that is distinctly Mindanao art. Now that I am a, a resource speaker here again for the second time, allow me to say that Viva XCon played a major role in moving our vision forward. Being a resource speaker in the Viva XCon 2016 in Iloilo City made me realize that there is a need to organize a mini art residency and exchange program for, for Mindanaoan artists. Hence the creation of the Panag Abot. So now we wanted to learn from the masters. The intention of the Panag Abut was to create a learning experience and exposure for art students and aspiring artists of the vow. That's because there were very few avenues available to learn from. The mini art resident residency named Panag Abut brought in Charlie Ko and his company of artists and Manny Garibay and his group of artists. We learned so much from the lineup, however, we lacked the resources and the, and the support to sustain it. We also learned that more than the need to build an art residency and learning, Mindanaoan artists need to build a self-sustaining industry that is fully immersed in our people and culture. The following month, I was featured again. I was featured artist of Mindanao, of, of Manila Art in Manila in 2017. Again, I saw the need to bring events like Viva XCon and Manila Art to Mindanao. What if we can gather artworks of all Mindanaoan artists and put it into one exhibit? What would it take for that to happen? Uh, kami ma invite sa art fair to observe and particip participate. There was so much for us artists here in Mindanao to learn from. Viva XCon and Manila Art. Manila Art was already on its 10th year when I was invited as a featured artist, the Viva XCon was on its 13th Binale when I was invited, invited as a resource speaker. We have yet to start something of, this, of that scale here in Mindanao. So which gives birth to the first Mindanao art. The first Mindanao Art Fair conference and exhibit in 2019 was a big regional art fair. 10 art groups exhibited, six from Davao City and four, four from other Mindanao regions. There was maximum coverage by art and lifestyle writers from both the local media and the national media. It was the biggest art fair in Mindanao. We also took the visiting media to various art spaces in the city to give them an insight into how Mindanao art is taking shape. The Mindanao art talk, on the other hand, had an impressive lineup with the country's most sought after visual artists who had roots in Mindanao. They talked about building audiences to curating to marketing. 
there were over 4,000 people every day to visit the exhibit. The success of the first Mindanao Art got all of us at Lawig Diwa so excited for the Mindanao Art 2020. We already imagined a bigger venue and a much wider scope, a grand art, art fair in the pandemic. So here comes the COVID-19. However, COVID-19 happened, suddenly the plan had to be revised and adjustments had to be made. It wouldn't have been easier to back down and cancel the second Mindanao Art Fair until the pandemic is over. If we did it, it wouldn't have been one of the biggest art events in, in, in Asia, in Southeast Asia. Instead of a mall setting, Mindanao Art 2020 set up a Davao City Art Group physical exhibit in a college campus where there is completely open air lobby for the physical exhibit and a two fully air conditioned floors for organizational meetings and equipment. This time, 16 art groups joined. They were four from Davao City and 12 from other provinces. We are all coming from different cultural backgrounds, each representing the people that define Mindanao, the Lumad, the Moro, and the settlers. The bulk of the art fair had to be online. Mindanao Art has its own website to host all the art groups that participated. We also introduced Mindanao made virtual conference technology, we call it the blank space, which hosted the live opening program and canned art talks. But the biggest surprise to all was the launching of the virtual museums that are distinctly Mindanao. Can we show them the, uh, the video still running? These virtual museums, which will house the works of regional galleries and art groups and serve as visualization tools for the ultimate dream of creating regional art museums in key Mindanao localities. Online, the world has seen that Mindanao artists have to offer. In 2019, uh, Mindanao Arts Fair theme was traversing the river of creativity. The idea was to draw art as an ecosystem. Art could come down as just a trickle of, a, as a trickle unable to sustain an industry like what we have in Mindanao. We can steam down with inspired creations or rampage as a destructive flood. Whatever form it takes, it all flows towards bigger bodies and communities downstream. It will all depend on how art is nurtured and how its discourse is sustained. The original theme for Mindanao Art 2020 was tracking our unique cultural landscape. It was an invitation to go deeper into the art in Mindanao and know from where it emanates from. This changed to living art in the new landscape. From an in invitation to trek through and view as an observer, Mindanao art evolved to advocate living art, dwelling in it and breathing in it. In a way, this pandemic made our priorities and action plans clearer to find the soul of Mindanao art and to produce the, a next generation of artists that are firmly rooted to their identity, but confident in their abilities to create from this collective soul. To do that, they have to immerse themselves in the communities and get to know the land and its indigenous people firsthand. Only then can we start to see that art that is distinctly Mindanao. So we're taking Mindanao art forward. If there is anything that COVID-19 continues to teach, it is to be out there for the world to see. There is no longer just about making it in Manila market. How we achieve that requires more than 10,000 hours of deliberate practice. That's because this covers everything. From your soul, to your art, to your network, to your market. Okay. The good news about this is that COVID-19 place us all in an unfamiliar waters. 
we are all starting line. How we will fare in the race will depend on us as regional artists. Okay. This brings us to Mindanao Art, the vehicle and the vision itself. We are sailing towards the real Mindanao Art, the one that is rooted within the wellspring of our identity as Mindanaoans, the one that defines our collective soul. We believe that there is no Philippine art to speak of, that, that there are just very good Filipino artists. Philippine art cannot be just the art defined by the, mean, by the Manila market. It has to be defined by the collective soul of the Filipinos. It has to come from the individual communities that will carry them, the colors and rhythm and emotions of the place. We want to contribute our share in bringing this about by leaving a legacy of art that is truly Mindanaoan for the generations after us to study and allow and follow. Through Viva XCON, let there be Visayan art. Our colleagues in Luzon can embark on the journey for Luzon art. All together, we will be the Philippine art. How by finding our roots, defining it, and then growing from it? What is it that shrubs in the heart of every Mindanaoan? What are the ideals of the land? From, the root, from that rootedness, an, aspiring, an aspirant grows into an artist who is grounded and confident of his identity. And from there, he will find his soul from where he will draw inspiration. Mindanao art tells a beautiful story of unity in a very difficult time from a, from a land that is that conflict and disparity have supposedly divided us. If we can bring out much despite these challenges, what can we do when everything is back to normal? So that ends my, my talk. Paul. Thank you very much. Thank you, uh, Kublai. Yes, Pa. <laughs> yes, thank you for showing us your, uh, sharing your inspiring story and for showing us the potential and promise of the culturally rich landscape in Mindanao, rich arts landscape in Mindanao. For our last speaker for this particular segment on the art market, uh, I would like to call on Mr. June Villalon. Cesar June Villalon is a proprietor and director of the drawing room. Um, one moment, um, Ida, can we kindly put up uh, Mr. Villalon's bio slide? Never mind the bio, Gina. <laughs> okay, I will read it aloud. <laughs> um, Kay June is the proprietor and director of The Drawing Room, one of the leading art galleries in the Philippines. He has run The Drawing Room for 23 years, exhibiting Filipino artists in his Makati space and in major local art platforms, as well as in important international art capitals, such as Hong Kong, Singapore, Taipei, Jakarta, New York, and Paris. June graduated with a Bachelor of Arts in Interdisciplinary Studies from the Ateneo de Manila University and completed the Senior Managers Program at the Asian Institute of Management. An art collector since the mid 80s, he worked as a manager in the sales division of Colgate Palmolive Philippines and Johnson & Johnson Philippines finally leaving corporate life after 10 years to enter the art world as a gallerist. Let us all please welcome Mr. June Villalon. Hi, Gina. Good morning. Hello. Hi, hi. And hello to artists, friends from the Visayas and other places. Can we have the first slide, please? Yeah, next please. Okay, um, the drawing room pretty much started as a gallery that specialized with works on paper. So for the five, first five years, 
of the gallery's existence, we only sold and showed works on paper. Um, I thought works on paper were not as appreciated as the other art forms or other medias like canvas or sculptures. Um, but there wasn't, there wasn't anyone in Manila at that time that really put focus on paperwork. So I said, as a sales and marketing person, I would like to create a space that solely exhibits paperwork. So for the first five years, it was an exciting first five years for the gallery. Um, we were quite successful actually. But um, next slide, please. But after five years, we had to evolve now because the artists we work very closely with um, would want to show other types of work. You know? So it led us to open a bigger gallery space. Um, now we've shown, we, we show different medias. You know? We show sculptures, we show object-based works, we show canvas works. This slide shows the work of Jose Santos that we did in 2019 at our gallery at the Caravan Plaza. The show is titled Bardo. You could see object-based pieces on the wall and some sculptures scattered all over the gallery. Next slide, please. We also collaborated with Angel Show to do a group show for the gallery. Um, the artist you see on the left side of the wall is by Kawai and Degia. The middle portion is a light box by Marco Stignani, and then Alfredo Achilles' works at the back. Next slide, please. These images are not meant to intimidate our young artists, no? I mean, we, we also show a lot of canvas pieces, but these are, more, these are the significant shows that we had a year ago and two years ago. This particular slide shows the exhibition of Leo Abaya entitled Nowadays. In the middle portion of the gallery, you will see, I think these are palai, live palai works, no? uh, plants that was left in the gallery until the duration of the show. Also a video at the end of the gallery space, an installation on the left side. Next slide, please. Okay, in terms of programming, um, yeah, the, the, the picture you see here is our last participation at Art Basel Hong Kong, wherein we featured Lilibeth Cuenca Rasmussen, a Danish Filipino artist. And we had a very interesting presentation in the sense that we brought a coffin-like structure into the fair and placed it in the middle of the booth. Lilibeth would lie there for hours, just talking to people while lying down. Lilibeth is a well-known performance artist in Denmark and in Scandinavia. Next slide, please. Yeah, next slide, please. Okay, a aside from the normal solo shows, annual or biannual, we do with our artists, we also do quite a bit of art fairs in the region, as well as in Europe and the United States. This particular slide, you will see a presentation we did at the Armour Show in New York in 2018, wherein we brought Jose Santos's sculptures. We brought around six sculptures scattered around the booth. But these are all objects, object-based kind of work and sculpture. Next slide, please. Um, we were lucky that, I was lucky that I went to the Venice Biennale in, in Venice, no? To support Mark Cristiniani's presentation there. As you know, Mark was the representative of the Philippines in the Venice Biennale in 2019. Next slide, please. We also do, as I said, um, we do fairs in the region. And this one is at Sea Focus in Singapore. Uh, we brought Manuel Ocampo's works there. Uh, this is a boutique fair. It's called Sea Focus. We're in only about 30 galleries are invited to join. 
Yeah, next slide, please. We also did the Melbourne Art Fair in Australia in 2019, wherein we brought um, Dex Fernandez's wall installation that you see in the middle part of the booth, and Jokna Pasilan on the left and the right side of the booth. Jokna is based in Australia. These are all paperworks. Next slide, please. This is at Art Basel, Hong Kong, wherein we brought Dex Fernandez and Miguel Aquilizan, as well as Robert Gutierrez. So you will see the things that we bring to fairs are not only canvas pieces, but actually more on the object-based type of work, sculpture, and a bit of installation. Next slide, please. We did the Paris Fair in 2018. Actually, we've done this fair for, I think, three times already. The picture you see on the wall is by Vermont Coronel, and the one in the middle is by um, Alvin Gregorio. This is in Paris. Next slide, please. We did a local fair called All 2020 in Manila last year. It's, it's a group show of artists that we work with. So you see Jock Napasilan's light boxes in the middle, Miguel Aquilizan on the right side, Robert Gutierrez on the left side, and Yason Banal at the foreground, and Pam Santos at the other end. Next slide, please. Um, aside from the art fairs that we do here and abroad, we also try to bring in important foreign artists to show in the gallery. This particular slide, uh, you will see, it's, we invited Rirkrit Tiravanij and Toma, Tomas Vu to do a show at the gallery. Actually, they flew in. They're the ones at the farthest end of the space. Rirkrit is well known and is already a part of art history. I mean, for fine art students, they're very familiar with Rirkrit's work. So it's a mixture of installation, floor installation, wall. And, and it was quite exciting because they printed silkscreen t-shirts and gave it away to people that attended the show. As a matter of fact, Tricky is probably there. It was a very important exhibition for us and we're very lucky to have her clips come to the gallery. Next slide, please. We also brought in Joris van de Murta from Belgium. Joris is represented by, represented by Natalie Obadia in Paris. Um, he performed, he's a musician too. No? So aside from the wall pieces and objects and sculptures, he performed um, using his own guitar. And so it was really a sound, sound art type of experience no? which people enjoyed. So this year, we're, we're, we, we might be able to bring in another important artist from Vietnam, Ding Kiu Lei. So hopefully we can bring, it, bring Ding to do a show with us towards the latter, latter part of the year. So we try to do that. We've also shown some young Japanese artists in the past. Next slide, please. Okay, aside, aside from art fairs and intergal. Oh, before this, I'm sorry. We also do quite a bit of intergallery exhibitions. No? As a matter of fact, we're probably one of the first galleries in Manila that did intergallery shows in the region. We've done shows with Art Gallery in Jakarta many years ago. We did a show in Hong Kong with Rossi and Rossi. We did a show with Natalie Obadia in Paris two years ago with Robert Gutierrez. So we try to to allays with galleries, not only in, in Southeast Asia, but also in Europe. No? Um, I think it's a very good way to show artworks from the Philippines out there and, and see how people react to our artworks. We also have this artist development thing that we try to do off-site, off-gallery shows. No? I mean, to be more involved in the community outside the gallery. Um, uh, two years ago, we, we had a space in Intramuros in one of the old buildings there. And I think we stayed there for six months. So we, we leased a small space. I mean, just to be part of that exciting 
community and Escolta and an exciting group of people that run that space. So in that space, we, we brought in Lilibet Rasmussen from Denmark to do a few days of residency. So what you see on the up, upper portion, the, the picture is on the upper left side, is Lilibet Rasmussen performing inside that small booth in Escolta. So people could talk to her and she could talk to, 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 to artists. You know? um, the two other pictures, the one on the right, uh, next slide, please. Yeah, that's Lilibet performing in Escolta. So we had that space for around six months. So we, we rotate exhibits there. Next slide, please. And this is Jed Merino's Quentum Cochero, where he collaborated with the Cocheros in Intramuros. No? So <coughs> what you see here are real horse carriage that he acquired via the help of the Cocheros in Intramuros. So we did this in a church, in, old, in, in a church in Intramuros. So we try to do efforts and activities off-site of the gallery and be in that particular community, to feel that community, to contribute in that community, and to make art more accessible. Next slide, please. Well, this is Jokno Pasilan, also in Intramuros. <laughs> okay. Jokno Wait, is... Lang video. Yeah. Jokno is, um, is from Bacolod and is part of a boat building family there. So he recreated a boat structure that we place inside the, in Intramuros. Next slide, please. Um, because of the pandemic, we, we were quite active with social media, Instagram, and Facebook. No? Um, we also have this segment called Work in Progress, or we call it WIP, where our artists would send us a 60-minute video um, to show what they're doing during the pandemic. So most of the videos are not actually pictures of artworks, of their studio, but actually videos of their daily lives, no? what they do. Like Jed Merino was walking his dog all throughout you know, the, his town in Colombia. Um, one of our artists would like, eat, eat a sandwich on top of a mountain. So, so we, we like that. No? We like to show what our artists are doing during the pandemic, not necessarily directly related to their art making. Next slide, please. Yeah, next slide. Okay, um, I was quite excited getting into this talk because I feel that I could share some insight as a gallerist for 23 years, and also as a collector. So I couldn't sleep very well last night because I was quite excited to share with the young artists from this IS and from the other places. Because, so so we, we're, we're, we're going to talk about the market and, and et cetera. No? So, what is very important, I think, is if an artist would want to participate in the art scene in Manila at the moment, you have to make sure that your works are in sync or jibes with the programming and vision of the gallery you want to work with. That is important because it is the gallery that will support your work inside the gallery. So the gallery has to believe in your work and, to, and has to st stand behind your work. Now, so you have to choose the gallery that matches the type of work that you do. Next slide, please. Yeah, again, you have to see well, what is the vision of that particular gallery? What is the, the branding that they, they want, that they have? And, what is the market or the audience of that particular gallery that you want to work with? It's important to say, like, there are galleries that are pretty open 
to object-based works, to sculptures, to installation. There are, are, there are galleries naman that are very open to canvas works, to drawings. So if you, for example, want to show or like to show object-based installation, you have to carefully choose the gallery that exhibits this type of work. Um, yeah, next slide, please. Yeah, at the moment, I think, I mean, the, the previous slide will be open to, I know quite a bit of questions. I'm very welcome to answer questions in terms of who or what type of gallery an artist should approach, what type of work should I present? I, I'll, I'll gladly answer that after this, no? Next slide, please. Yeah, again, during the pandemic, there are two, two areas that allow collectors or our enthous art enthusiasts to view your works. One is online, obviously social media, Instagram. And one is really the physical space. So at the moment, both are very important, no? online and physical space. Next slide, please. Yeah, as you know, sales are being done online because of the pandemic. There's a growing number of young and new collectors coming in. But there is also a bit of digital fatigue, I think, and it's also being reported. Napapagod din yung tao katitingin sa, sa mga social media. No? So my thinking is the physical space is really the most important thing. No? I mean, we have to get this online thing over as fast as we can. So we, will, so we can let people come into the gallery again and experience the artwork. You know, people, artists are selling online, but there's no substitute. I'm sure, you know, in, in, in doing shows, one look, looking at shows in physical spaces. No? Next slide, please. Yeah, again, the click, clicks and bricks approach, which again tells us that both online and physical gallery space are very important. Next slide, please. Yeah, I wanted this to be very, very short because I really wanted to get questions from artists. Thank you very much. Thank you, Thank you very much, June, for your substantial and succinct presentation and for your detailed strategies for artists looking for gallery representation, particularly in Manila. So now we will move on to our question and answer portion, which we hope will be lively and interesting May I request all our speakers to turn on their videos and microphones? We are also privileged to have Dr. Patrick Flores join the Q&A. Uh, Patrick is the esteemed head curator of Kalibutan, The World in Mind, which is the main exhibition component of VivaXCon 2020. We believe that his vast experience in curatorship and his exposure to the international art world can provide a richness and insightfulness to our discussion with Tricky, Boone, and Kublai, with whom Patrick has worked in the past, all of them. Once again, I would like to point out that this conference segment is focused on art market prospects for Visayan artists or regional artists in general. We hope that the audience will send out questions through the Zoom, Zoom chat box or the Facebook uh, comment section of our VivaXCon 2020 account. Questions that can help us generate even more strategies that will benefit the peripheral or regional artists in general and the Visayan artists in particular. Our first question is from Patrick. <laughs> yeah. So thank you, Jun, Tricky, and Kumblai for the uh, wonderful presentations. Uh, maybe just to jumpstart the Q&A, I was uh, wondering if you can propose uh, 
because the three of you come from different experiences now and, and backgrounds if you can propose a like a site specific uh, market model for the visayas uh, I know that uh, the market as a system operates on or would like to operate on a predictable rules now, but uh, art is uh, something else. It thrives on eccentricity and also of course uh, specificity. Uh, so I was wondering if uh, even your experience in developing uh, uh, systems, no? because a gallery is a system, an art fair is a system. Uh, what would you propose for the Visayas, uh, a site-specific uh, Visayas um, uh, market model? <clears throat> so that's basically my, 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 my question. And how would that market model, how should that be seen in relation to the other parts of the ecology that might be more robust in the Visayas. No? So uh, for instance, uh, the other arts, no? like maybe cinema or theater or institutions like museums or artist generated spaces, which I think are emerging in the Visayas. And of course, this tendency for some artists to manage themselves, no? independent of institutions, independent of the market. So these are some forces at play in the current ecology that in a way have, uh, have uh, prospered even without the market. So if one would propose a market model in this site, how would that model uh, relate with this ecology? So I'm not really, uh, uh, I mean- When you say offsite, Patrick. Um, sorry, I mean the Visayas as a site. Ah, okay. Uh, yeah, so I'm not after very detailed uh, propositions, now. just uh, to, to sketch out, you know, mm -hmm. the aspects of this model, yeah that you can think of for the um, Can you hear me? Yeah. Okay, yeah, no. Um, I've always wanted to go to Jakarta when they have their, um, you know, they have something there every year. Um, I believe it's run by artists. Um, the Indonesian artists organize um, the studio visit, this, these events. Um, and it's, I think, a selling, it's a selling um, event as well, but it's, they do it themselves, the artists do it themselves. Um, I think a lot, their galleries, of course, support it, no? but they do it themselves. And I believe Christie's actually is a sponsor. So um, what they do is um, they encourage, I think it's every July or August. No? I've never been, and I was hoping to have gone last year. Um, what they do is they encourage um, art enthusiasts to fly into Jakarta, visit artists, see how they work, um, get to know the artists uh, based in Jakarta, which I think is a large chunk of the Indonesian art scene. And um, they have talks, they have dinners. So it's, I, from what I gather, it's a nice fun event, but it's also an art centric um, event. So something like that, my, I, as I said, no, my gosh, the Visayas has so much to offer, the beaches, the food, um, the people. <laughs> so, you know, it's adding art into the mix maybe by um, putting an element of artist visits and meet and greets <clears throat> by there, you know, in a minute when I can. So something like that might be interesting to do. Yeah. So, uh, Okay, it's the creative ecology, you know, uh, tricky. That's what you are uh, yes. yeah. thinking of. Yeah. I think you were f referring to Art John, right? Every August? Yes, yes. Art John. Yes. yes. So, John, yeah, you yeah, were. Yeah, I'm Patrick coming in as, an, as a commercial gallery, you know. Mm -hmm. um, I would like to work with 
<clears throat> Visayan or Mindanawan artists. It's just that I, I think the best way is to liaise or coordinate with groups like, for example, in Bacolod, the Orange Gallery, because I know Charlie personally. But I'm, oh, of course, I can work with anyone. No? And also in Mindanao, for example, Koblai. Maybe these are starting points mm -hmm. for us to do something together. Actually, Charlie has always been wanting to coordinate with us, hindi lang machempo champo no? So as a commercial gallery, yun na nakikita ko na ma-jump start yung, mm -hmm. yung galaw nung, 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 mar, nung art, nung, ecol, nung art market, no? Um, if you could show good works from Mindanao, from Desires in my gallery, in a curated fashion, na, na in sync then sa vision ng gallery. So, sa ngayon, yun lang naiisip ko muna, no? I, I need to show or coordinate with groups in these areas to, to create an activity. And then, you know, later on, we could think of other things, maybe. So, so John, it's like to just to stir up, no? To stir up the energy. Yeah, the, 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 yeah. Get it off. There the has head. to be some excitement, you know, excitement. But it has to be a good show. You know, alam naman nila Charlie, no? I mean, mm. so it has to be a good, good show. Para may excitement, <laughs> may impact, mm. and then we'll see what what doors it can open, no? But in that situation. Uh, June, and I, I imagine it to be also to be productive relationship. It has to be two way, no? So yes. can drawing room also exhibit in the Visayas? Yes, I'd, I'd like to do that. Hindi lang talaga, wala lang nagpo Well, Charlie has always asked me to do it, but again, hindi rin maupuan ng maayos. But I'd like to do that, no? Um, so I'm open to Mindanao and Visayas. Para may, well, the, the overused word, the dialogue, you know, between Manila and, and, and the re other regions. But it's important. Yeah. Now, as a commercial gallery, I have some experience in, in creating an exciting show because that's my, my job no? as a gallerist. I have experience with social media and promotions. So if we could just sit down and do something nice, you know, it can open a lot of things, I think. So, so you, we have two models now, no? the, the creative ecology model from Tricky, and then the inter-gallery, uh, inter-regional model from, from June. I'm sure Koblai has another model. Uh, <laughs> so what is your model, Koblai? Uh, Galita Patrick, um, here in Mindanao, uh, medyo naiiwang kami, so kaya the strategy is to dream big, no? Um, if you've seen our um, envisioned museums, actually, we are actually inching our way. The, 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 the way I'm saying that we're inching our way, kasi nga, what we wanted is um, uh, we're, we're searching for deeper narratives here in Mindanao. So the, the Mindanao art platform, yun yung idea namin is to, to inject or, or tell our artists to, to go deeper. And then by, by having that platform, na express namin doon yung mga kwento at yung mga storya at nagiging art. But the thing is, where do you put it? You have to have a repository for it. For the longest time, I've been a cultural worker for 20 years. I've been... I've been um, going around communities. Ang ginagawa namin is uh, we've been collating, nagiging repository kami ng mga music, ng mga kwento, ng mga artifacts, and where do we put that? So, so we're really thinking of putting up a, a center for that. Now, same, same like, like for example, sa Visayas, uh, every Viva Expo, um, walang napupuntahan or in a gallery, but the, 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 the works in the gallery are changing. So it's not permanent. Imagine if, if Viva would um, leave those uh, specific works based on, on the Visayas narratives. No? 
every year, iiwan sila ng isang pyesa, like me, I'm a monument maker. Every time I, I do a piece, I, I leave a monument that is there to stand for generations. So, so if you start that now, for, for this diva, every year, lalaki ng lalaki, and people would be going into that physical space. So, parang, parang ganun siya. It's a bit, um, kasi nga, coming from um, an artist like myself who've been doing major monuments, you can actually, the, the exercise of the, of the art fair platform can actually be turned into something that is uh, literally there for, for generations to see. So, so your message mo will be encapsulated in time because it's displayed in a public space. So, yun yung ano namin dito na, na we're thinking that every year with Mindanao Art, um, we wanted to come up with a main centerpiece which can now eventually be turned into something um, in steel, in concrete, or in whatever material that would last, and we could donate that to a or to a, a city or a province or any rotondas in Mindanao. That way, no, we, we capture the stories one by one and through time. And and in the long run, the the whole po the whole place will, will become a a, a stories captured in, in in art. So that's one possibility for the Visayas. Actually, I. I've been talking to Charlie before that I can actually help in a way in, in magnifying your uh, maraming mga pyesa, maraming konsepto ang Visayas. Pero but it's not collated in, in one library, in one art place na, na pwedeng dun lahat malaman ng mga, mga young artists natin. So for example, uh, just to give you an idea here, what we're doing is we're, we're going deep into communities, we're trying to to make sure that the communities are ready for, for the artists to go to. Pag safe na sila pumunta, nakaka-explore nakaka sila, nakututo sila, then pagbalik nila, mas malalim na yung yung, yung uh, kwento nila. So we have all this, uh, like like we're weaving one, one community to the other. But pag nailagay mo na siya sa isang specific na space, it becomes a lasting work. Something like that, Patrick. Yeah, thank you. So that's the third model, no? In institution building, no? Uh, it's important also in relation to market building, no? So I think that's it, Gina, for me. Yeah. Thank you, thank you, Patrick. Uh, we have a lot of questions actually in the chat, but uh, I just want to start with this, uh, as Tricky and I had a previous talk about this. Uh, the pandemic has sped up our migration to all manner of online communication and online transactions. So uh, most people say online is here to stay. So it can be argued that the most remote artist, the most remote regional artist can have a global reach. Do you advise regional artists to attempt to bypass Manila and go straight to overseas, take advantage of this um, online, uh, all, all the benefits of online communication and transactions. Uh, this is addressed to all of you and perhaps even Patrick, if you would like to respond. But Tricky, can you start? Why not? <laughs> Why not? Um, um, you know, upping your reach um, is a way of, Instagram Live, as I said, is um, so, it's used so much now by, um, by artists, by museums, by museum curators to, I guess, widen their public. Um, so why not, um, why not aim beyond Manila? Um, for instance, no, there's this um, small gallery which started in the Netherlands called Avant Art. Um, it is run by, I think, a millennial in his 20s, or maybe he's a little older now. Um, he loved art, but he lived, um, I can't remember the exact, province of the Netherlands. He was out of the cultural centers, but he loved art. So he started just asking big artists to like, can you make um, merchandise that I can sell through my, through an online platform so that I can say that I am working with big name artists. So I think the artist found him cute, like that idea. Um, eventually his, because he was selling to people in his age group, um, he um, was able to sustain his operations and eventually those artists started giving him more ambitious work, sold many through an online platform. I um, encountered him because he was, again, it was an Instagram live talk with um, 
um, a gallery is from Berlin, um, Koenig Gallery. And even um, through, I think, one of the, the curator of the of LA MOCA, which is Klaus Beisenbach, who said that I'm reaching out to you. I have to admit your art is not exactly my type, what I would show in LA MOCA, but this um, pandemic has proven that your um, way of reaching out to both artists and collectors seems the way that institutions or even commercial art establishments will survive. So um, sky's the limit, right? Um, with the online platforms. So mm -hmm. why not? Um, oh, sorry, and I'd like to add, there's another artist from the Visayas, Chris Ardena, um, who we featured in the art fair last year. But I actually first saw his work in Art Dubai. He was represented by a gallery from Cebu. I never saw his work in Manila. And um, it's beautiful work. Um, I think he works out of Bacolod now. Uh, he works with a gallery in Hong Kong. And um, he um, has achieved his success and his um, standing in the current art scene and the art market without first um, seeing success in Manila. So yes, of course it's possible. Thank you. Uh, John, would you like to say something? Yeah. Um, if, if the artist is not working very closely with a gallery, either exclusive or semi-exclusive, whatever you call it, as long as that artist is not, again, working very closely with the gallery, it's okay. You know, go online, promote your work, show your work. You can even sell. Diba? Wala namang problem sa tingin ko dyan. And the, 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 the internet and the social media is a very powerful tool for artists to spread or to show their works in a very fast manner, in a very effective way. No? Ang, ang, compli ang complicated lang kung yung artist is working very closely with a particular gallery. There has, they have to coordinate. Diba? For example, Gina, you're my artist. We, we can talk about it. Oh, oh Jun, post ko to, ah, post ko tong artworks ko. But I can, I can tell them for inquiries, go to the drawing room or ask the drawing room. So, nagko-coordinate kayo. Hindi yung parang, ito na, nag, nagpo-post, yung gallery nagpo-post. So, magulo. No? Mm -hmm. Pero kung wala namang ganung setup na work, uh, close working relationship, you can do whatever you want. That's fine. All right. Thank you, June. Uh, Kublai, do you have anything to add to that? Uh, yes, Gina. Um, medyo iba po yung case namin dito sa Mindanao kasi uh, our artists mostly are ano, nasa malalayong lugar. Ano? Ang, mm -hmm. ang lalayo talaga namin. Ang, ang hirap lang sa social media is when when the artist comes out in social media, tapos hindi, hindi hinog yung trabaho niya. Mm. Kasi nga, napag-iwanan kami dito. That's why we are really working hard. Kami nasa mga, mga kuya at mga, mga seniors na for, for those young artists, we wanted to, to mentor, mentor them first. We wanted to educate them with the right, um, with the, with the right research, with the right... Uh, kasi hindi sila nakakap... nakakap punta hindi nila nakikilala talaga yung they have the, they don't have the holistic idea yet of, of what we're trying to say and tell and share kaya nasisira yung yung narrative so but but of all ano wala naman talagang uh, limitation din kasi they they can own the social media we just advise them to to contemplate first mag, mag Mag, mag matuto muna tayo sa 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 Visayas and sa Luzon we, 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 ano, and then 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 we come out together as as a collective parang ganun po yung suggestion ko mm -hmm. uh, but during this historic era of the pandemic um, as June was saying uh, in a previous talk many emerging artists really are selling their works through Instagram Facebook Viber uh, because they have to, they have to earn income in the short term. So, but Kublai mentioned that there is a possible drawback or disadvantage to this in when they put out work that is not yet hinog, quote unquote, not yet fully developed. So there are apparently drawbacks to posting and selling 
your works on your own. Um, I don't know, do you think there could be a long-term or there could be an effect on the artist's reputation after yeah. the pandemic is over? Will they get, will they have difficulty later on getting representation? And then if they display their pricing on their Facebook posts and Instagram posts, is that a disadvantage or an advantage? Because we're still dealing, uh, we're still in this historic era and artists need to survive as well, so. Yeah, ako Gina, I'm thinking hmm. ganito. If, kung bata ka pa, if you're young, you, you are a young artist, shoot hmm. in different directions. You know, do whatever you want. Magkamali ka, you know, bata ka pa naman, you know, pwede, you have to learn from your mistakes sometimes. Eh. So, mm-hmm. may hirap din natin i-control masyado. No? So, yeah, put out your works there and, and take the hit. You know, if it's not enough, somebody tells you it's no good, you take the hit, roll with it, mm-hmm. and learn from it. Ang mahirap lang siguro, kasi ganun naman nagsistart yung mga batang artist, di ba? And they mm-hmm. learn from their mistakes. Sige, sige lang. No, that's fine, you know. They sell, they need it. They have financial pressures. That's fine. Ganun lang. Ganun lang naman yan. But sabi ko nga sa Eugene, ano, di ba? When, wag lang tumagal sa ganun. Di ba? Wag, la, wag lang tatagal yung artist sa uh, too much compromises, too much uh, selling, whatever. You, you can't stay there for long. Kasi in the medium to long term, that's not good for you. Mm-hmm. You know? Ang, ang mahirap lang kung siguro, kung medyo hindi ka na masyadong bata and keep on posting things of subpar quality. Medyo mahirap. Pero for very young artists, you know, experiment. You know, diba? okay. Sabi nga ni Tricky, be true to yourself. You, the things that you post, you should like it. It should represent you. If it doesn't represent you well, you take the hit. You know, ganun lang. All right. Thank you, June. Uh, Tricky, do you have anything to add to that? Um, you know, uh, in the end, art really has to be experienced live. Art is a social space, um, mm-hmm. uh, to quote one of the curators that I listened to last week. So um, online will go hand in hand with live events, physical events, but it cannot totally replace it. Right now, it does. Um, there's art that's great online, um, but... Um, there, there's really nothing like seeing art in the flesh. So, um, yes, uh, right now, the question was, kasi, can you buy a Pass Manila? Yes. But in the long run, people, if, if you want longevity as an artist, we have to see what your exhibits are like, you know, what you really have to say. And I think you're not going to be able to do that only on social media platforms or online platforms. Okay. Um, I think uh-huh. it's time. Oh, uh, his, oh yes, Kublai, yes. Uh, yung, ano lang po, yung point ko lang yung when I was saying that um, we need to be to be sensitive with our social media posts. Um, I think um, for, for us artists, this is a really, really good time for, for us to reflect on our art because there's a pandemic. So hindi, um, the, the direction is more inward than outward. And then when you feel like going outward after the, the, this uh, out, after this um, reflection, then sure, yun lang naman yung ano narin. But in many of our artists here in Mindanao, um, nahihirapan po kami because uh, yun na nga, ba- baka kasi mag-backfire yung, yung mga trabaho collectively, na labas sila na labas, mm-hmm. eh, tapos ang iba, dahil nga sa hirap po eh, uh, binabarter na lang ng, ng gatas, ng tupa sa anak nila. So, we, we really want to address those problems but but ang hirap talaga po yung ano, yung yung totoong mga sitwasyon dito sa, sa buhay, especially here. So, um, that's why we, we are reaching out to, to, to just about every artist here in Mindanao to, to be more mindful, be more thoughtful, be more sensitive. To, in, in sharing their art. Mm-hmm. Yes, and, and that's related to this question, uh, which actually is directed to June from Tina Shidid. Uh, I'd like to ask Mr. Villalon uh, what he means by branding, because you mentioned branding in your uh, presentation. And could you please give an example? 
Yeah, um, I think the gallery is is a brand in in many ways. No, my image, sha. No, there's an image. There's a brand that's attached to it, and you develop that brand. You develop that image, but in an honest fashion. Mm. No, when you create an image. You have to be honest. You have to do your homework. You have to be true to yourself. But that image or that brand sticks, no? And that image or a brand, you have an audience. You have a consumer. That's why it's a brand, right? Mm-hmm. No, you talk to your consumer. You you do some research. You pricing, right? When you talk about a brand, there's trial. You try the brand. There's pricing schemes. Strategies, there's promotional strategies. So that's what I meant. The gallery as a brand has to do all the other activities to improve that brand, to make that brand successful. And top of mind, you have to have good artists, right? You have to have the right pricing of those artists. You have to have the right promotion. You have to have the right exposure. So, but I'm product to show brand, right? Oh. I'm gonna. So, so both the art gallery and the artist must be careful about their own branding and to cultivate their own branding. But uh, for those who are, who, um, but for, for, to... young, for young artists, Gina, parang I don't want to be too conscious first about having a brand for themselves. Mm-hmm. Parang, ang gusto ko for young artists is really to shoot in different direction. Try a lot of things in your work. Because may lalabas dyan eh. May lalabas dyan na tama for you. That's, that you like. And that's true to you. Mm-hmm. So mm-hmm. even when, when artists come to me no, to show me works, minsan yung the work that he shows me, hindi ko type, hindi yata bagay sa gallery. So I ask him sometimes, can you show me your other works? Tapos may papakita siya. Oops, may nakita ako. O, ito. Parang pwede ito. Gawa pa rin ng artist. But for my gallery, sabihin ko, baka yun mas bagay. And maybe, you know. So, yeah. Now, these are very good strategies and insights. I think um, that's all the time we have for the Q&A. Although we do have other questions, but many of your answers have actually touched on these questions. Um, so thank you very much for this fruitful discussion, which I'm sure many of the artists and audience will continue to ponder on after this segment. Thank you. And now we will proceed to, well, thank you, Tricky, June, and Kublai. And Ang now ikli, Gina. Huh? Ang ikli. Ang ikli ba? <laughs> oh, I want to hear Patrick already. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, maybe you can direct questions to Patrick later. <laughs> Uh, so now I would like to um, to uh, introduce uh, our second speaker, our speaker for this second talk, uh, which will highlight the ideas, concerns, and processes behind the making of an art exhibition. And specifically in our case, Viva XCON 2020's main exhibition entitled Kalibutan, The World in Mind. This is the last for Node 1, the last talk for Node 1, of a seminar on a possible exhibition, uh, Curators Converse, what happens into, with, and through the world. I would now like to reintroduce our head curator, Dr. Patrick Flores. Uh, Patrick, would you like me to read your bio or you want to jump straight in? Oh, I can read it, it's short. (laughs) Dr. Patrick Flores, yeah, I will properly introduce you now. Patrick is- Uh, eh. (laughs) Patrick is currently curator of the UP Vargas Museum and professor of art studies at the University of the Philippines. He was a grantee of the Asian Cultural Council in 2010, a member of the Guggenheim Museum's Asian Uh, Art Council in 2014, and a guest scholar of the Getty Research Institute in Los Angeles in 2015. In 20, sorry, in 2014. In 2015, he served as curator of the Philippine Pavilion in the country's 
returned to the Venice Biennale after a 51 year hiatus. In 2016, he co-curated the contemporary art exhibition South by Southeast for the Guangdong Times Museum in Guangzhou, China. In 2019, he took the helm of the Singapore Biennale as artistic director. Let us all please welcome Dr. Pla Patrick Flores. Uh, th thank you, Gina, for that uh, introduction. I, I will uh, share my mm -hmm. slide now. All right. So the, uh, uh, the, uh, for the past few Saturdays, the six curators of uh, Kalibutan have been uh, fleshing out the proposition of uh, the main exhibition of uh, Viva, Viva XCon uh, 2020, and this is Kalibutan, the world in mind. So as part of that team, I, I also chose some artists. Um, uh, I also chose some artists and this is a, a time for me to uh, talk about uh, the, these artists, no? just to uh, round out the, uh, uh, the uh, presentation of uh, the artists for Kalibutan. Uh, so uh, we are, of course, the, uh, focusing on the word Kalibutan, which is a Pan-Visayan term for both world and consciousness. And uh, we are interested in how the artist uh, proposes uh, works that um, uh, flesh out their condition of being in the world and thinking through the world. And finally, looking after this world with care as well as with anxiety, affection, or even obsession. So uh, uh, as it was with the other uh, curators, uh, they, they, the other curators talked about their interests in, in the Visayas, so their interest in the Visayas, their investment in the Visayas. So I'd like to share my own. Uh, Visayas in personal history, I was born in the Visayas. I was born in Iloilo. Uh, my father was a government auditor, so we had to go around the Visayas uh, with him. Uh, he would be assigned from place to place within, within the region. So I was born in Induilo, and then he was assigned to Tacloban, so we went with him. My mother is from Tacloban. And then finally, we went to Cebu before finally settling down in uh, Manila in, I think, 1979. Uh, so uh, I spent much of my childhood years in, in the Visayas, and I spoke the languages of the places we, 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 stayed, we stayed in. So I speak, I speak, Ilong, I speak Ilong, of course, Waray and uh, Cebuano. So before I became fluent in Filipino or English, I was speaking those three languages. And so I, I think that that has shaped, that has shaped my, how I speak Filipino and English, and uh, which is, which I find interesting. So that's my, in, my investment in, in the in the in, in the Visayas, I I'm also a product of the public school system. I, I went to uh, public school in the Visayas from grade uh, one to four, I think. Yeah, uh, yeah. So second, uh, I'm interested in Viva XCon as a curatorial model and a method. Uh, so this is not only a repeating a serial event. We can derive from the Viva XCon a certain modality and methodology of doing things. So I regard it as a sustainable, inter-organizational, extra-institutional, itinerant uh, uh, project. Uh, it's been going on for 30 years, uh, uh, thriving on uh, the efforts between organizations within the region. and. Uh, for the most part, extra institutional, meaning independent of uh, institutions, uh, established institutions like museums or uh, cultural centers, although not totally alienated from them. And then itinerant because it moves within across the islands. 
Second, it is collaborative, uh, artist-generated, but uh, more recently, curatorially mediated. No? So there is this balance between an artist-generated project and, and the fact that it can also be curated. No? So it's a tricky, delicate balance that has to be achieved. I've curated several of these exhibitions in uh, for Viva, the first one in Dumaguete, and then one in Bacolod, then Iloilo, and then now Bacolod, Bacolod again. So I have had experiences uh, curating exhibitions for Viva. And then third, it's multi-format and interdisciplinary, uh, meaning uh, it involves different forms of artworks and within different forms of circulations too. So it is an exhibition, it is a conference, so there's a discourse, uh, discursive program. Uh, there's a skills and network building aspect to it. Uh, it's just, I mean, if the takeaway is just camaraderie, then it is good enough, I think. Uh, uh, there is conviviality in Viva, friendships have developed through Viva. This uh, sociality is important for Viva, so I think it cannot be dismissed simply as uh, like extra aesthetic because the, the, the that sociality informs the ecology of the region. And then mutual support no, for the, across different concerns, no? whether humanitarian or intellectual, or, I mean, life lessons, I suppose. So that for me, that's a model that is sustainable and also uh, for me, uh, I think worth uh, uh, replicating maybe in other sites. No? A third, uh, that I'm interested also in the art history and the art world in the Visayas. I'm interested in modernism in the um, Visayas, uh, the lineages of the contemporary, we can say at this point, maybe tentatively. Uh, that's why I always, I mean, every time I curate Viva, I, uh, I make it a point to also introduce a modernist artist from the, from the place. Now it began with the, the Jess Aiko exhibition in Bacolod, because Jess was a very influential figure in Bacolod. And so it was a good time for Viva to not only pay tribute to, to his art, but also to uh, propose a different kind of art history from Bacolod to inform the art history that is mainly written in Manila. No? So, so uh, that was a good experience, the uh, exhibition of uh, of Jess Aiko in Bacolod. And then in Iloilo, I curated uh, a sculptural work of Timoteo Humayao, who was also influential in that part of, of the Visayas. Uh, and gives us a different uh, articulation of sculpture, modern sculpture uh, in, in, in the Visayas. So for, for the Viva XCON 2020, uh, we are doing four of we are doing four exhibitions. Uh, there is this uh, interface between two, two important artists from Silai who are uh, Leandro Luxin, the architect, but who was also uh, a modernist artist and a painter and uh, Lino Severino who painted landscapes and scenes uh, uh, of the Visayas and, and beyond. He became a pilot too. Yeah, uh, so that's one exhibition. There's also an exhibition on Brenda Fajardo, who is, of course, we all know Brenda, an important pillar as well of Viva and of, of art in the Visayas. And then Nune Lucio Alvarado, an important, um, um, painter and artist uh, in the Visayas and from the, the late 70s, early 80s to, to the present. So those four, I think would, would, would uh, uh, offer a, a, a different uh, 
uh, perspective on how modernism uh, emerges from a particular site. So that's my interest as an art historian who also curates contemporary art and Viva is about that too. So uh, while we are interested in lineages, we of course uh, are attentive as well to circulations in the present through contemporary art. And that's why there is Kalibutan and then other uh, exhibitions around Kalibutan that uh, are maybe more artist generated, more, uh, more uh, organic uh, to some extent. No? And then finally, I'm interested in Visayan practice and knowledge, meaning that uh, there are ways of making that are uh, honed and cultivated in the Visayas that might be, uh, I mean, that Manila or other parts of the country might not be aware of. So I'm interested in this practice, which of course feeds into a knowledge system conceptualizations in language, folklore research, and scholarship. So the idea of Kalibutan is one, and the Kalibutan is, is an example of that conceptualization. That theory, theory can emerge from the site, no? that it doesn't have to be imported from the outside, although one of course doesn't want to uh, also isolate oneself from the outside when we have to uh, 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 invest in the effort to uh, uh, harness uh, ways of knowing uh, that have been uh, shaped by the site. So Kalibutan is a, is a gesture towards that. No, that Kalibutan as a concept comes from the Visayas. No? It doesn't come from like, Germany or, or, or France no? or the United States. It comes from us. Uh, this is not being nativist. This is just being decisively local no? and uh, uh, making us, uh, make, I mean, investing us with that strength intellectual strength to mediate whatever conceptualization may, may come from the outside. No? Yeah. So, uh, so as far as my selection of artists, I'm interested in ethical ecology, the attentiveness of the artist to the world and the relationships with others. So I call it ethical ecology. I'm interested in the citizen artist uh, with broad sympathies. An artist not only interested in careers, but also in other things besides, and uh, whose background has been shaped by other things besides fine art education. I'm, there's nothing wrong with fine arts education, but the world is bigger than the fine arts academy, no? So uh, I'm interested in uh, citizen artists with broad sympathies. Uh, I'm interested in the migrant imagination. So my, some of, many of the artists, uh, are migrant themselves or uh, that their forms move across localities. I'm interested in artists with intellectual curiosity that they don't just repeat uh, what they learned in certain systems of uh, learning, but are curious about how the world works and how the world could be changed in one way or another. And then I'm interested in artists who are patient with process, that they are not, that do, they do not rush to make uh, fully formed works and actually can, uh, you know, live with uh, loose ends or rough edges or things that are still in, in the making. So just like the Kalibutan. So just to the artists, uh, uh, Lani Maestro from whose origin is, it who, can, who traces uh, a part of her origin in Antique. Uh, she talks about uh, one of, a woman who uh, had helped uh, her mother raise the family. Um, she is now in uh, France, but has also stay, stayed in, in Canada for some time. Uh, 
uh, we are including this work from a neon work from it's it's a it's a existing work a neon work with of text like it is this it's a more poetic evocation of uh, of the of the current condition or uh, yeah the kalibutan that kalibutan is this that it is this meaning this situation is the kalibutan and he she's also invested in in gugma as a concept that's why love figures here and she would try to elaborate on this in uh, in maybe a conversation uh, across the uh, the uh, exhibition Leo Abaya is from Bohol uh, uh, but works in Manila he, she, he teaches in UP Diliman uh, but he has a practice as well in uh, production design for cinema. And so I'm interested in this, uh, in Leo's uh, practice in moving image in relation to, of course, the visual arts. So for, for Viva, he will do a diorama in the making, no? a landscape in the making image progressing weekly from November 2020 to July 2021. So this is part of my prompt to the curators to encourage artists to uh, to do protracted work, meaning work that protracts, uh, in in which the form is delayed. The final form is delayed, or the final form is actually not anticipated because there is no final form everything moves across now so that might be an interesting concept that is responsive to the uh, pandemic condition so uh, this is a proposal on sanda pita so where basically where and this is a st study of the topographical matrix of the diorama by changing place and this was the first articulation which was uh, digitally released last week if i'm not mistaken so uh this is the first initial, first articulation of that uh, of that of this uh, series of dioramic uh, images no? uh, yeah and the uh, captions uh, also are conceptualizations in in binisaya like uh, panghi panghinamin Panghinamin, Oghinumdumi are translations of reflection and remembrance. So, uh, like, like uh, Kalibutan, Leo would also like to propose the conceptualizations in language. No? Uh, Jowar Songkuya is from Iloilo, but uh, is working in Manila now. He recently had a show at Altromondo and uh, has been recently admitted to the UP uh, College of Fine Arts. So he was trained as a, uh, a sailor, a marine engineer. I don't know what, I hope uh, the fine arts education will not sp <laughs> spoil his, <laughs> his previous creative life, but enhance it instead. So he, he has been sailing the world for almost a decade as a marine engineer and has traveled to over 50 countries and 86 international shipping ports and terminals worldwide. So Jawar will present uh, not only his paintings but also his diaries because this experience with the sea has shaped his paintings too. So in very intimate uh, entries in the diaries uh, from the Indian Ocean in Amsterdam and uh, like this one which is uh, poetic no? and also poignant. These are photographs of Joar that he, I mean in the sea, in the, in the ship uh, and also some videos. Uh, I'd also like to include some videos which he also made while in the ships now yeah and early works i'm interested in the early work so uh, for Jawar, i'm interested in the archive of, of my practice so diary film and photograph 
early works no like that and then for the for the and for the uh, exhibition he he'd like to do a series of uh, the atlantic the pacific and the arctic no so the, these are some studies for for the series atlantic pacific and arctic and then Ryan Bernardino is from Bohol, who is now based in London. Uh, is a young Filipino artist. Yeah, so her practice crosses media, including sculpture, installation, performance, and photography. So her central concern is the body as both a private and a public space, and the the way sorry the way that gender identity and politics has evolved in recent decades. So oh, this is one of the uh, performative works of Ryan in, I think, in, in Europe and maybe in London. Yeah. So for Viva, uh, he, she wants to collect 30,000 pieces of peso coins to be sent to Bacolod from different sources in the Philippines. So she is now looking for a fountain in the orange district, on uh, the art district, to, to, to situate this project. Uh, so he, he she wants to use this opportunity to connect and check in with friends, families, and colleagues, and ask for their participation in in the project. And then, as a relational gesture, uh, he she will give them the option to either receive an art for for their contribution, reimbursement of their expenses, or a meal or a treat that we can share in person when we meet sometime in the future. So this anticipates a physical contact uh, whenever that arrives. Uh. So the idea is to create a wishing well in Bacolod wherein the peso coins collected will be utilized. One peso is equal to one wish. No? So this is still, uh, we're still developing this. No? Josh Serafin is from Bacolod too. Uh, is from Bacolod, but is based in uh, Belgium now, in Brussels. So he's a, mm, he's a dancer, performer, performer, maker of movement, currently based in in Brussels. No? So he was trained in dance, but he has also done theater and uh, so on and so forth. He has also done choreography. So this is Josh. Uh, this is one of his uh, projects involving beauty pageants in the Visayas. No? Uh, and then for the proposal of Josh, it's, uh, he's interested in the states of being queer, of the states of being, queer politics, and uh, uh, concepts uh, clustering around around those. Uh, and I quote him, I've always felt that I'm in constant state of displacement. The body which is this material object I inhibit doesn't correlate and never felt belong, that I felt that I belong to societies I have, I have lived in. No. So this is the uh, proposal for for uh, <clears throat> Viva Excon. Want, he wants to design environment and uh, to embody personas. So the aim is to decolonize and queer heter heteronormative uh, historical iconographies through the lens of pre-colonial gender Philippines, pre-colonial Philippine gender fluidity. So this is a. Uh, uh, text from folklore, um, Tangpungan, and in one of his posts in, on FB, he actually has uh, uh, juxtaposed this text with some moving image already. No? So this is also a developing concept. No? So, and uh, he is also developing this cosmological gangbang, birth and recreation of a new universal gang goddess that embodies all cultures so we we we, we will develop this uh, over time no? and then charles ben Conceo, the final artist in in the list is from cebu but is now based in uh, new zealand no? so uh, he worked as a commercial photographer his artistic practice builds upon an ongoing inquiry and the construction of visual culture or he pursues through print, video, and installation. Yeah. So the proposal for it's a it's a done work. It's an existing work, but that will be augmented by a work that responds to the current condition. So moving away, according to him, from the hard matter of objects, he turns his attention to the seemingly soft, abstract world of computed data, 
the insurmountable amount of knowledge that has been encoded algorithmically and uploaded to the web. So inducing boredom, fascination, or pure terror, name kind application, date last open, date added, date modified, date created, size tags, this is the work, as just how much can we know in the face of all that has been made knowable. So this is the uh, proposition of Charles Bunken and this is the work that was exhibited at, at Art Informal. So, so we will do, we will uh, restage this in, in Bacolod, but he will also do something new in relation to the algorithm of the pandemic. So I think I will end there, Gina. And, uh, yes like to uh, I, mean, I can I can answer some questions if there are thank you very much Patrick uh, it's actually wonderful to learn about your Visayan background I'm not <laughs> sure uh, how many people know about that and um, and it's wonderful to go through your you know your thought processes behind curation um, in in this slide there's one quick question it's actually in the context of a concern that emerged from the previous talk on the art market about mm -hmm. artists' uh, issues or concerns about getting noticed or breaking into the art world. How did you as curator notice or discover, if you want to use that word, mm -hmm. these artists, in particular the diasporic artists? Mm -hmm. How did you find them? And maybe it is a quick answer. Well, Sam. Some I know already, I, mm -hmm. uh, in one way or another. Others I had to do research, and I also had to ask uh, those coming from the Visayas, no? those in the on the ground in the field, mm -hmm. uh, if they can, uh, if they can suggest some some names. I also acted as some kind of an oversight person. I gave the six curators the you know the. Uh, in a way, the opportunity to, uh, to propose artists first. And then as, as, as the lead curator of Kalibutan, uh, I thought it would be good to uh, round it out a bit or fill some gaps. If the, the, the uh, I mean, tendencies uh, that are not uh, addressed. Uh, so it's like some kind of an oversight function uh, but uh, of course, I can only do so much. Uh, as, 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 I mean, but Viva evolves anyway. This will not be the last Viva. So there will be more uh, discoveries uh, as we move along here. So uh, you yourself as a curator, you, you, uh, did you make use of the um, technological advancements, the online platforms, and, mm -hmm. um, and uh, whether it's through social media or websites of other galleries, um, aside from being, of course, tipped off by artist mm -hmm. friends and curators in the Philippines and abroad. But did you make full use of this? Uh, it just, and, and among your artists, who are the new ones you've discovered in this last year? Uh, yeah, of course, I, I made use of that. I mean, uh, as uh, maybe a first step, no? Mm -hmm. Of course, you, you turn to some aggregators <laughs> mm -hmm. in the internet to, to give you some leads, no? It is a first step. It's not the terminus. Right. But, uh, and, so many, and some of these artists have, have sites of their own. Mm -hmm. So it is a, it's a, a, you know, a tendency now that artists uh, develop their own sites. They self-historicize. I mean, they don't need... Uh, I mean, they don't have to wait for art historians to historicize them. They can historicize themselves no? uh, by uh, making themselves present. Did Is that you... a good thing? Well, it's a thing. It's a thing. <laughs> I mean, uh, I mean, you know, there are many ways about it, but uh, it's an important voice, mm -hmm. central voice in some extent. Uh, we, we have to uh, hear that voice uh, as we write art history. So, uh, yeah, I mean, the second question is whom did I discover? Uh, Brian, Brian Bernardino, 
Ryan, uh, I don't know so well. Did she have a site of her own? Okay, Ryan and Jowar. And you are. Jowar. Jowar, I came to know uh, via Libby Limoso, mm -hmm. who is one of the curators na? Mm -hmm. uh, from uh, Region 6. So, yeah. So, though, uh, Jowar and Ryan, I don't know so well. But the rest, uh, and maybe Charles too, sorry, Charles, yeah. Mm -hmm. But Charles has been active in Manila. Mm -hmm. So, I, I'm quite familiar with, with the work. No? I mean, before he went, to to he migrated to to New Zealand, I, I was quite familiar with, uh, and he has won some prizes too, mm. in, in 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 Manila. But uh, in terms of you know uh, knowledge of their work, those three are the most unfamiliar. All right, thank you. And uh, we have a question here: How did you guide Kalibutan artists or the artists for the show Kalibutan in translating concepts to physical works? Can you share to us your process of curatorial mediation? Mm -hmm. Well, I think that's what this whole seminar is about. <laughs> yeah, it's a good question. But uh, yeah, I of course propose. I mean, I, 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 there is no formula for this. No? Uh, each artist uh, responds to uh, propositions in, in, in a particular way. Mm -hmm. So you, you, you approach the artist, you, you propose, I mean, intellectually the the uh, i mean you you give them the brief now but before that before you choose the artist you also have to learn about the artist no mm -hmm. meaning uh, if how more or less he or she will respond to the proposition uh, based on his or her uh, previous work experience practice and so on and so forth and you begin a conversation no uh with very basic questions like how do you respond to it i mean uh, instinctively and then maybe later intellectually and then we, we we develop it's a series of 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 conversations uh that moves in and out of the discourse and also of the practice uh, because the discourse should not be imposed on the practice uh, the, the the practice has to the practice is an agent as well that mm -hmm. responds to the uh, discourse that can be reshaped by the practice in the same way that the discourse can reshape the practice by maybe let us say uh, leading it to a different angle or uh, uh, or uh, like highlighting an aspect that has been neglected or discovering a potential that is in the practice but not so well developed but the uh, the curatorial proposition uh, tries to harness it no? so I mean there are many ways in which the two mutually uh, shape each other meaning the curatorial discourse and the practice yeah mm -hmm. mm. So that's actually quite interesting. So in the context of our earlier talk, it's actually in the artist's best interest to put out a site of his or her own, his, as you said, perhaps historicize mm. himself, herself, putting oneself out there to be discovered, not just by the art market galleries, but by curators, people who are the gatekeepers, such as you. Uh, yeah, I, I think it's important, uh, not only for self-representation, self mm -hmm. but also to uh, be part of a conversation mm -hmm. in the digital world or elsewhere, uh, because in the site, you can also put your, I mean, I mean, ideas, put in some ideas or list some articles that have uh, discussed your work mm -hmm. and so on and so forth. So it's an important voice. I mean, of course you choreograph it in a particular way in your interests, but that's, that's one way to look at one's practice. Yeah. Right. Mm -hmm. Very good. Um, and it's good for everyone here to know because uh, that's really a question on uh, top of mind for many people. Um, and we have, I think we have time for one more question. 
it's a pretty big one actually, but I think you are the best person to answer this. In your opinion, what is Visayan art? In the many years of working with Visayan artists, can you perhaps give an, an idea of what Visayan art is? What makes them Visayan or what is, what is Visayan art? Yeah, that's, I mean, maybe not the most productive question to ask, uh, Gina, although I, um, I understand where it's coming from and uh, how it has been, I mean, what, what the, uh, what forces have conditioned mm -hmm. uh, or made that question so attractive, I mean, or so necessary for some to ask, no? Mm -hmm. uh, it has something to do with uh, representation, it has something to do with uh, the politics of identity, it also has something to do with uh, uh, strategic differentiation from Manila mm -hmm. or elsewhere. So it is, uh, it is, uh, it is coming from that place, uh, which I think has to be in, in examined or questioned. I mean, mm -hmm. Why do you have to ask that question in the first place? It's not a default question. It should not be a default question. So if you want to ask, uh, if you want to ask that, I also challenge you to ask yourself, why are you asking it? Mm -hmm. uh, uh, because it's part of your, uh, I mean, you know, the process of learning by asking what you think you should ask now uh, and why you need answers for some questions. So uh, I'd rather keep it more open to, and say that, uh, I mean, to look at the Visayas as a location or a site mm -hmm. in which art is made. So instead of saying Visayan art, one could say more provisionally, more openly, art in the Visayas, mm -hmm. yeah? art in the Visayas. And what do we mean by Visayas? you can explain. Right, right. Uh, which, when we try to explain what Visayas is or what it constitutes, then we might also want to ask what art is in relation to the Visayas. Huh? Yeah, so, so art is not spared. Yes. From the, uh, from the examination in relation to the place. Huh? Because right. the place shapes the art and the art shapes the place. No? So that's where I am at when mm -hmm. I respond to this kind of question. It's like a never ending question because from the Visayas, you can ask what makes Philippine art, what mm -hmm. makes Southeast Asian art. So it's, I think we should stop really somewhere. And I think your answer of focusing on art in the Visayas rather than Visayas art is the good mm -hmm. answer. <laughs> All right. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. um, well, it is, um, I think we've gone over time and uh, there are no more questions left or you've answered most of them. Thank you very much, Patrick, for uh, illuminating this conversation. And yeah. thank you very much too to Tricky, June and Kublai for be being very game in answering all our questions about the art market. Um, at this point, I would- Thank you, Gina. To thank you, Gina, for moderating. Ah, yeah. you're welcome. It's a tough job. <laughs> moderating with you in front of me. Yeah, thank you. Thank um, you. I would also like to now uh, call back our ex-con director, Mr. Manny Montelibano, to close this session. Thank you very much, Patrick, Tricky, Kublai, June, um, and of course the staff of um, Vicon Two. Um, I would like to congratulate um, um, your, you specifically, even in these times, we have done, um, we, we've been um, active in nurturing our communities through this, even if it's online. And I think we have expanded and um, um, saw the benefits no, of continuing discussions and um, um, talking about related issues um, regarding our art practice. Mm -hmm. And um, sharing your views is quite um, um, good, no? Uh, especially in these times, no? 
it actually takes us out from our anxieties and focus uh, towards the future. Um, thank you very much. Um, and also I would like to thank Gina for hosting. And um, also I would like to thank our sponsors um, for supporting us. Um, we are also um, have, we, will, we still have um, many topics uh, for this month. Um, we'll be launching uh, two um, music videos from local artists um, and also um, other, other topics no, in celebration for the um, National Arts Month. So I wish you well, stay safe. Uh, don't forget to wear your mask and um, smile even if it's uh, nakatago. <laughs> People will know that you, you are smiling. So thank you very much. Have a pleasant weekend. Thank you. Bye. Thank you everyone. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye. Tayon, tiyon na nga baguhon Ang banas ng panglakaton Numan ang madangtan Sa pinili kong adalan Kabay nga hindi pa Ulihi ang talan Di ng mga sinya sa cross Nga alagyan Ang talag ko Sa panglakaton Uy iining mga bugat nga Dalalon sa imo Paminsaroon Kagbalat tiyagon Uy iining mga bugat nga Dalalon Nga dalalon Nga dalalon Dali na kay Maimo ta Sang bago
Ipabutsyag sa katawhan ang imo nga nabalan ang kaalam naging bungkal sa kadutaan ipalaplag mo sa hangin ang unod sining sugilanon para mga tubang hangkat sang henerasyon tang mga katawhan nagduhaw sa kadutaan ibalik ta ang balanse sang karibu Pagitait yara sa imo kagyara man sa mo.